So, my first question to you is... Yes? What's your name? No. <laughs> my name is Simon Barry. Awesome. It's glad that you know. Yes. I just, just making sure. <laughs> just making sure. Um, well, it has been a long day, so sometimes I forget. You seem to have such a TV-oriented career, so a lot of people tend to go into film and then maybe they yeah. switch over to TV, so how come you decided to go the, the TV route? Uh, well, it's funny, you know, TV kind of chooses you the same way features, in a way, choose you. I started in features, actually. My first professional job was in, a fe was in features. I was um, uh, writing features when I started my writing career and got an agent and sold my first script, which was a feature script, and got my first job, which was for Warner Brothers, which was on a feature. So I started really thinking that that was where I wanted to be, which is, at the time, was where everyone wanted to be, which is the mid-90s, before TV was really this cool. <laughs> it was still, you know, and TV was dominated by sitcoms, and one-hour dramas were really just police procedurals. You know, there wasn't, there really wasn't as, there were shows like, um, the Sopranos, which were starting to come out, but that wasn't until a little bit later, I think. And then um, uh, the idea of a serialized one-hour drama was really kind of a, still a very bizarre notion. In fact, my first foray into TV was when the, the beginnings of limited series were kind of hitting the American broad cable networks. And um, that's when it, when it became an opportunity for me, because having written features, no one thought I was capable of doing television, I guess, or that, that just didn't come across my desk. But then uh, USA Network was starting to do these long-form limiteds, and I got an opportunity to do a book adaptation, uh, which seemed like something a feature writer would do, a book adaptation, which I had done before, and long-form, which was similar to movies. And that kind of got me into the TV business. Uh, but I hadn't even looked for TV work, really, until that came my way. And unfortunately, it didn't get made, but it was a really great learning experience because the way TV works is very different. And I met people in the, during that experience that are all now still working in the TV business that I still work with, which is kind of nice. So there's a, <clears throat> sometimes the business chooses you for things, you don't choose them, and you, you, you kind of surf that wave. A TV is increasingly looking like a movie, but yeah. told in. Well, the stories are more, the writing actually too. I find that the writing in movies is, declined while the TV writing, the quality of TV writing has has gotten better. And then also I think the types of stories TV has opened itself up to are conducive to feature writers, you know, because they have more, they're, you don't have to rush through the storytelling process in a long form television or even in a one hour series. You can do TV shows the way they used to make independent movies. So the movies I was watching in the 90s were like indie movies from Miramax and Working Title that were not trying to just be spectacle. They were actually character studies and, and more nuanced storytelling, which, which is where TV is now. So it, it's funny. The, uh, the, the business has you know, shifted and adjusted and evolved in a way that just ended up lining up with my group path. <laughs> luck. It's all down to luck, folks. Sorry. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that um, you know movie writing has sort of declined versus TV writing has become better, mm -hmm. and we're seeing things like there's definitely a lot more diversity in TV. Um, but do you attribute part of that to also the, this concept of the writers' room? I think yeah. I mean, weirdly, movies have now adopted the writers' room model. Uh, I know a lot of feature writers who are working on big tentpole movies like the Transformer series. And they now are seeing the transplanting of the writer's room model in the features uh, business, which is really a testament, I think, to, the, to why TV writing has been so successful, is that you do have uh, multiple diverse voices in one room. Making something better is actually a much smarter way of doing it. There are always going to be kind of great writers who are individually just so talented that they can capture in a movie the voice that needs to be caught in a way that's ideal and of course there are hundreds of examples of that working but you know now that movies are really almost serialized movie stories where you have five movies six movies in a series it only makes sense that they would now adopt a tv writing model to that uh so and even i've been approached for certain movie titles that they want to now look at uh adjusting into a almost like a small season 
uh, you know, of television, but for the fe for features. So titles that you associate with features, that instead of doing them as a TV show, they just do a series of movies that will be released over you know s several years. But they treat them like you're breaking an episode or sorry a season of TV episode by episode. So I'm sure a lot of people are sort of curious to be a little bit of a fly on the wall. I know I am. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Um, a writer's room. Yeah. So can you sort of take us into a day in the writer's room of, say, your last show, Ghost yeah. Sports, or most recent show, not your last yeah. show? Yeah. Well, I'm in the writing room right now um, on a new show. So it's very, you know, the writing room is a really creative space. It's a place where less writing actually happens than people realize. It's really, a, a, it should be called the talking room because what we do most of the time is talk. So the writers' room for me is really a place where you try to you try to organize these ideas, try to organize creativity, and then at a certain point when we when everyone in the room understands what the show is, who's in it, what the characters are up to, uh, what their intentions are, what their obstacles are, then we start to shape the episodes in terms of scenes and in terms of storylines, and it evolves to a point where everyone can look at each other and go, okay, I think I can write an actual script now. I think I know enough about this, this story and these characters where I can go off uh, on my own and we all go our separate w ways and write a script of a show that we've already kind of seen in our heads. But now we have to communicate that to producers and directors and actors and the crew and the network so that they understand what we've got in our head. So it becomes at that point an expression. Ooh. How do you go about deciding, well, this is the right person for this writer's room beyond just, you know, their abilities? Yeah. I don't know. I think there's a combination of things. I mean, you're, you, you want people who have the, uh, who have experience on one hand, but also not too much experience on the other hand, because you want to have people who aren't too rigid in their way of thinking and their creative process. So a balance of that is good. I think you want people who are uh, open to failure, creative failure, so they'll, they're will they not afraid to speak up and pitch an idea that might be shot down or may go nowhere, but at least they're comfortable trying and experimenting with creativity in a verbal way, because a writing room, if no one talks in a writing room, nothing gets done. So you need people who talk and you need people who comment, you need, you need challenging uh, ideas, you know, you need debate. So it's got to be someone who is comfortable defending uh, their ideas and also poking holes in someone else's idea. And I think you also, obviously you want good writing. I mean, at the end of the day, the writer's room, the composite of the writing room is not just to develop great ideas in the room as concepts, but to execute them on the page. And as a showrunner, my life has made so much easier if I don't have to rewrite scripts because I've already got scripts that I have to write, and I have all these other duties as a showrunner that have nothing to do with the writing room. So for me to have writers who I trust that will execute a draft that I can read and make like almost no notes on is the ideal version of the writing room for me. And you find people like that as you go. So there are people you always go back to and say, hey, this is someone I know I can count on. But every now and then you also want to give someone a chance who hasn't proven themselves and you want to, but you have a feeling they might be able to. So it's a real combination. It's like a, it's kind of like a team. It's like what you would put on a, on a baseball team or a, or a good dinner party. You know, it's like this, it's like everyone's good at something specific. Everyone's coming up from a different point of view. Everyone can say, well, what about this version? And the more of that you have, sometimes the better the room is. Okay. And you want nice people, like, you know, no jerks, no assholes, no no, no. People who aren't coming at it from ego really make the room better because it's really all about the story. And if people are just serving ego, then it manifests in weird ways. And there's hierarchies that just don't work, and and personalities clash. And so try to kind of limit the the ego, either ego feeding or insecure writer or someone who's just not there for that. They're not there for the story or the show. They're there for themselves. Uh, with you know Canadian films, which can also be sort of considered independent films, yeah. there's always such a struggle to find an audience, um, even you know at home, mm -hmm. let alone across the borders. Um, but with TV shows like Continuum and some of the other shows that you've done, um, you, you know you were able to transition from, you know it's popular not just in Canada but it's yeah. even maybe even more so popular around the world and yeah. in the U.S. What do you attribute that to? 
Well, I think TV, the access to TV makes it possible for people to find something they like and then share it and talk about it with their friends. Movies are harder to, you know, if a movie doesn't get uh, a real promotional push, its window of opportunity is very limited. It either it grabs people's attention or it doesn't, and then it gets replaced by the next movie that comes along. So in theaters, it's really hard to get people to consistently come back again and again to see a movie and to keep a movie around long enough that word of mouth allows it to grow. I wish I wish it did have that time, but the business of theatrical exhibition just is really challenging, and there's always another movie waiting to come in. Um, TV is something that's that remains available through Netflix, through reruns, through networks that recycle their own shows. So you can hear about a show years after it's aired and discover it again and become a fan after the first uh, viewing. And I think the story of what happened with Breaking Bad is a great example of how a show could have been on the air for two years and no one really was uh, on the scale that it ended up having. No one was really aware of it at that scale. And then because of Netflix and because of the uh, network having it in their library, people could finally catch up and rewatch it and then jump on board the season as it was coming out so they were up to speed with everybody else who had been watching from the beginning and that just had a snowball effect. So by the time the season was in its last season, the show was in its last season, the audience had multiplied exponentially. And I think that it's harder to do that in movies. Uh, also in movies you get this one release and that's it. A TV show gets an annual uh, uh, real, real, real life, you know, it, it gets re-promoted, uh, the, uh, the advertising gets re recycled again, and so a television show can really have many lives, and if it doesn't succeed in its first or second year, sometimes Netflix or Amazon or Hulu will provide a platform for people to find the show, discover the show, fall in love with it, and then they can catch up with it in its ensuing seasons, which is really... It's kind of like a uh, it's an opportunity to to do better every year if the show stays on the air. And Continuum was certainly a show that uh, had very little exposure in its early years, and then as people discovered it, got grew a fan base um, that was really you know allowed the show to sell to other countries and expand its reach and things like that. So. Well, and you worked both in film, you mentioned, and also, obviously now, a lot of TV. Are there lessons that you think could be borrowed <laughs> by filmmakers from the TV, wor TV wow. world? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, the lessons... I always think that... The, the, I wish there were lessons that you could apply to everything. It feels like every time I deal with a new project, I'm learning new lessons that don't apply didn't don't apply from the previous one and may not apply to the next one that each story has its own requirements I mean you learn lessons about how to be productive and manage better but the lessons of storytelling I mean other than the fundamentals of, of drama I think the lessons of screenwriting and and telling a story really are unique to the story you're telling in a lot of cases that you you just have to honor what you're setting out to do as much as possible. Uh, I think the lessons from previous shows that I've been able to apply have been really more about how I manage the process, not necessarily what the stories are. I mean, I think you fine-tune certain things that you, you want to, you'll have objectives that are clear, but sometimes you even, you don't even get to execute them the way you want, so what have you learned, really? You know, like, I don't know if I've learned anything, because it is a very unwieldy process. You, you start with an idea of what it's going to be and how it's going to go, and then it kind of takes on a life of its own, and it becomes its own thing. And you just have to hang on and hope that you can steer it a little bit into the direction you originally had in mind. <laughs> but that's good, too, because sometimes the show can become something much more interesting and much more dynamic and much richer than you ever could have conceived. So sometimes you get credit for things that you really just stuck around long enough to be part of, and sometimes you have to fight for things, but at the end of the day, it's still, is it entertaining? And will people watching at home care? Ultimately, that's the bottom line.